Good morning again to everyone that's not only here, but also uh, joining us online today. I want to thank you, and uh, also I want to thank our neighbors. We had more fireworks shot last night than I think in the whole time we've ever been here. I, I think they made up for a lot of fireworks shows that didn't happen this, week, this weekend. So uh, we had quite a, quite a spectacular weekend here anyway. I uh, want to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we gather together today uh, on this uh, first Sunday in July. Can you believe it? It's already half the year is gone. And so it's a, a, a great time for us to continue our time of worship, and I look forward to for this day. I, I look forward to this day for a very special reason, uh, and that special reason is sitting on the front row, my wife Lori right here. Our 40th wedding anniversary is today. So we're <laughs> so much joy, and I know many of you are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries, and, and I wish you the very much God's best uh, through all of those wonderful times of celebration. Let's go to God as we enter this worship service with some prayer, and then we'll have our mission moment. Thank you, Father. We praise you and ask that your blessing go over us today and help us, Lord, as we uh, worship you. Make that a time where we are just so, so connected, connected by our hearts, connected by our minds, connected by each other, and especially connected by your Holy Spirit. Lord, connect us today. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This time, I'm pleased to introduce our mission moment, and today that will be given to us by our building team chairman, and that is none other than John Newman. Lots happening here, so let's give him a hand. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm here to brief you on our home mission project the renovation and additions to St. Luke's United Methodist Church. Starting around the middle of March, the electrical contractor was on site making renovations and preparations to maintain to the main for the main construction crew to be able to do their work. Uh, and they also were doing the new uh, setup for Ameren's moving of our uh, transformer and, and whatnot with that. Uh, while the electrician was doing his work in April, May, and June, many church members uh, were helpful in preparing the sanctuary for the uh, crew of contractors to do their work, including demolition and renovation. The preparations involved removing the pews, including the Bibles, hymnals, pew pads, altar reels, and furnishings, uh, and the audio and visual equipment and related wiring. Uh, while preparing for the construction, we discovered several items around the church that we will not need and or have the space to store them or use these items at all. So we have utilized the internet to sell many items that we did not see a need to keep any longer. Uh, some of the items removed from the sanctuary have now been installed in, or stored in the Parkhurst uh, multi-purpose room. Uh, and some of the things that were removed were moved to the uh, Parkhurst multi-purpose room to give, to give us a new um, monitors, speakers, video equipment, computer. Uh, those have all been uh, moved from the sanctuary to the Parkhurst and now we have a, uh, a multiplex room. Uh, the electrician has been very helpful in getting us set up with new LED lighting throughout the sanctuary. Uh, the first week in June saw us doing the uh, demolition work outside the sanctuary on the grounds, and then they moved into the building. Uh, as many of you may know, with changes in older buildings, unforeseen issues arise. <laughs> and we are not exempt from that. 
Uh, after the demolition crew removed the altar and carpet and flooring, they discovered a second raised altar and flooring. This altar and flooring was set on top of the main flooring level without uh, floor joists below it. Oh. I mean, there was floor joists to support the altar, but it was a narrow, thin section. And once they removed that, they found out there was a big hole between the two levels. So they had to put in floor joists and uh, subflooring and uh, we're all good on that. Um, another issue that was discovered during the demolition was we had uh, some more asbestos on site. Um, it was not a large sum, but it was enough to have a asbestos abatement crew come in and do their work. They have since completed, uh, left the facility, and it is all good, and they are moving on. Um, Outside the building, the contractor has removed the trees. Uh, they have uh, dug for a uh, foundation for the new uh, entry area. Um, the old transformer will probably be removed in the next couple of weeks because they have got everything ready to go except hooking up to the main power on the new pole that's uh, south of the parking lot. Uh, phase one work will include the remodel of the sanctuary and the main new entrance, which you see being done right now. Uh, there will be four doors, four large doors, uh, three foot doors, that will allow us to get into the sanctuary, two in the center and two on each side. Uh, the new sanctuary will be brighter, more inviting, and more accessible to all those who attend our church. Uh, the work being done now with your support and financial help will transform our facilities into an inviting place of worship and a place to help our community grow in Christian outreach. If you build it, they will come. Now, John, I, I heard, I did some research on this, and I heard that the reason that that floor, those floor joints weren't in there, is that at one time they had a trap door right at the pulpit. But Ann did away with that. <laughs> and my only question really was, you know, did how did David take it when you told him that we no longer needed the pulpit under himself? <laughs> Let's sing. I was trying to get my praise team time to get up here, but they weren't taking the hint. <laughs>
our music staff rocking the rocking the floor joist out. So that's what I was saying. I'd like to invite us now into the time of community prayer. Uh, as we go to this time, uh, we want to remember uh, several things today. One, we want to remember our nation uh, and pray for our nation today. But also, uh, we want to remember some of our folks that are still struggling with some health issues. And this week, we want to add Joan Wiesahan uh, to that. And we want to pray uh, for Joan. Uh, she fell in her home and broke her tailbone. And so it's very painful. And so uh, if you all will join with me in prayer right now, we'll, we'll pray for her and we'll pray for her nation. Let's pray. God of all, all this world. Lord, you are sovereign over all. You are the God of our country. You're, you're the God of our church. You're the God of our hearts. And so, Lord, as we come before you today, uh, we call upon you. And we ask, Father, that your continued blessing uh, shower our nation. We ask that your continued blessing shower this area that we live in and, and love. And, and Father, we pray that you will uh, give us uh, a sense of your peace, Lord, that passes all understanding, a sense of, of peace even in the midst of storms of life that we face. Lord, uh, we've got several that are recovering from surgeries right now. We've got several that have recently had falls. And Joan, uh, we and him, we pray for her today. Lord, we ask that you will just help to every day, every hour, for that pain level to go down. And Lord, that you will heal those bones. And Lord, thank you for your, your presence in Joan's life and in her family. So we ask, Father, your blessing over Joan, but we also thank you, Lord, that uh, we can count on you for your healing power. We can count on you for knowing when we need healing. And sometimes it's emotional healing, as we talked about last week. Lord, uh, we pray over you. We pray over our emotional health, especially as we go in, under stresses that we've never experienced before, times in our lives that we never could have predicted. But yet, Lord, one thing that we can predict and one thing that we do know is that even through it all, you have been with us. Even through it all, you've never left us nor forsaken us. Even through it all, you're a God that we can count on in our lives. So, Lord, strengthen us from the inside out. Help our faith to be even stronger because of what we've gone through over these last several months. Lord, uh, give us a sense that you are so ever-present that we can be with you and commune with you on this day and always. In the blessed name of Jesus Christ, we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
again, I welcome you as we begin uh, our next to last sermon in our sermon series. Um, this one is one of those, those sermons that we need to hear, but sometimes we don't want to hear. I'll be honest with you. It's one that I have, have to struggle with because we're going to talk a little bit about the presence of evil. And the reality of that evil is something that uh, we don't want to even think about. So I'd like to visit with you just briefly uh, this morning about that. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, maybe you've noticed the same thing also, is that uh, we have this society that tends to either worship evil or allow evil to come to the forefront. Look at some of these movie titles, will you? Uh, does anybody see any evil in those movie titles? Uh, titles of, of what Hollywood thinks that we're interested in, okay? Um, but these are actual TV shows that are on. Did you know there's a TV show on now called Lucifer? Is that, is that something that kind of disturbs you a little bit? Uh, wow, just, just take a look at some of these things, uh, how evil is being portrayed in our everyday society here in America. So, um, you know, this is something that I did not grow up with, okay? I grew up with this. <clears throat> you know, you think about the evil things, you know, that Brutus and Popeye, anybody remember a little bit? Uh, do you remember the Joker? Uh, you know, with, with Batman and the Joker and Oh, and who could forget the Wicked Witch of the West? Okay, that was our picture of evil back in my day. I think it's, it, it's gotten worse instead of better. I, I really think that that is uh, something in Cinderella's story there, uh, the evil queen. So I want you to think about it, okay, the progression of, of our acceptance of evil uh, by our society has changed over these years. I mean, it's such a different world that we live in. And so I, I ask the question is, why do we then not recognize evil? Uh, you know, in our, all of these things that are going on around us, why don't we recognize it? Well, uh, to be honest with you, I believe that uh, almost all the plots, how many of you read books? Don't you know that there's good and evil in every book almost? I mean, the plot always puts the good guy against the bad guy. Now, some of you may have remembered John Wayne, the Duke. Okay, you remember? He was on the good side, and there was always a bad guy, wasn't there? Always. So uh, the, the way that we, we look at good versus evil has been sometimes a part of the plot. Well, if you think about it, even since creation. Um, evil is sometimes sensationalized by our culture. How many of you have ever come to your door on Halloween evening to see a five or six year old dressed as Freddy Krueger? Anybody? Or they have blood dripping down on a, on a mask or something like that. I mean, when did that suddenly become acceptable to dress our kids in evil costumes like that? You know, where, where did, when I, when I was growing up, man, boy, don't I sound like an old costume today? <laughs> when I was growing up, you know, we dressed like uh, some really nice characters like Peter Pan or, you know, some of those real wholesome characters, Mickey Mouse or Minnie Mouse. I mean, real wholesome characters. But now, it's kind of sensationalized, isn't it? Um, sometimes, I think it roots all the way back to our internal psyche that we believe that spiritual evil does not exist. And I'd like to debunk that misnomer today. I want us to think about um, some common misconceptions over that idea, all right? Because, uh, I believe that for us to have our eyes 
fully opened, we need to accept the, the fact that there is evil in this world. And one of our common misconceptions is that, well, demons were active during the time of Christ. Remember Christ uh, threw the demons over the cliff. Remember that in the, the herd of pigs and swine, as they call them in the Bible. Well, there are some that say, well, that's where it ended. There's no more demons active today. And that's a misconception. Because the scripture teaches us uh, that for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this, what kind of world? Dark. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Dark. This dark world. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Folks, it's here, it's always been here, and it continues to be here. In the book of Ephesians, Paul was warning this whole church, hey folks, evil is still present in our lives, even after Christ left this earth. Another common misconception about evil is that uh, the early church thought that demonic activity, as we now understand it, and we that we have now reclassified that in some way as just some mental illness. That people act in evil ways because they're mentally unbalanced or, or mentally ill. So um, science and, and the, you know, there's a little bit of a war going on and it's between the spiritual world and the scientific world. I'm a scientist by nature as a pharmacist. Many of you know that. And so I appreciate uh, both sides, and I believe that there's room for both. But in a way, there's a, a precept that says they're ignoring the spiritual world and biblical proofs of that spiritual world when diagnosing a patient. In other words, uh, none of that really exists, okay, that a person can't have a spiritual nature. It's all a physical nature in science. I believe it's both, <clears throat> okay? And so I see that uh, in, my, in my practice. You know, I believe that, that we are not only a physical being, but we're very much uh, an emotional and a spiritual being also. Another misconception about evil I'd like to visit with you about is that you know, some folks think, oh, you know, that's just some psychological event. Uh, and then there's also some spiritual event, so it's not connected. And I, I believe that's false. I think it's always connected. Uh, inside of each one of us, we always have an inner conflict. We always are pulled inside of our hearts and our lives in, in, in kind of an internal war or struggle. And when that happens, our mind and our emotions and our own human will are always at odds with each other. And so we constantly have this conflict. <coughs> Excuse me. Air conditioner is getting me today. So, um, we constantly have this conflict. Uh, and so, I believe that, you know, we think that we can be somewhat in separate compartments. But I believe those compartments are all connected. It's not just in our heads, folks. It's in our whole being. All right. So another misconception <clears throat> is that Christians are not subject to demonic activity. Now think about it. Uh, just because you have said yes to Jesus Christ being Lord in your life, that makes you still liable for demonic activity. I mean, you're still a target of evil. Even because, you know, and especially because you're a believer. So, why would the scripture, and we taught this a couple of weeks ago, why would the scripture teach us that we need to put on the full armor of God? 
Why would it teach us that if Satan wasn't in the presence of evil, wasn't here to harm us? <coughs> I think the presence of evil is on my voice this morning. Sorry. Yeah, Satan doesn't want me to say this message because it hits too close to home. So, one of the things that I want us to think about is that we've got to armor up and not let our guard down. We've got to allow ourselves to be ready for the spiritual battles of our life, and we're going to face them from time to time. Because those battles are real, folks. Yes, there's battles with good and evil inside of us, and inside of our, our days of our life here on this earth. Another misconception that we have sometimes is that Demonic influence is only evident in some kind of extreme situation or like when violence is, is a part of the sinful behavior. So if someone goes out and commits a horrible crime, uh, we believe that might be demonic, but it's not true. Um, it's demonic influences and everything. Uh, Dr. Anderson who wrote the book, The Bondage Breaker, to help us break the bondage of spiritual evil in our lives, said these wonderful words. He said, it's not the few raving demoniacs which are causing the church to be ineffective. Ooh, he's getting into our grill, isn't he? <laughs> but Satan's subtle deception and intrusion into the lives of normal believers <laughs> Folks, we're living in a time when normal is hard to define, right? But we are we are those that believe in Jesus Christ. So if, if our normal state is one that's challenged by evil, um, that's what we need to have our eyes open to. We have to have our eyes wide open and, and to guard against uh, the attack and the arrows that Satan would bring our way. Let's take another one, and then we'll, then we'll try to tie this up. Another misconception is that freedom, and I, I'm doing an entire culminating sermon next week on how to experience and have and claim your spiritual freedom. That's how I'm going to tie this together for the end of this, this series. But freedom from spiritual bondage is a result of, of an encounter with demonic forces this is some, something that we think okay I need someone out there or something out there to point my finger to to blame you all have never played the blame game have you <laughs> oh the devil made me do it right right and we point our finger at the the presence of evil or oh you know it's just my nature that caused me to do that. Well, uh, the power of Satan, as Dr. Anderson helps us to reveal, is, is in the lie. The power of Satan uh, is, is when that lie becomes truth to us. But the power of the believer is in knowing the truth, and we're to pursue that truth and not the power of the lie. Okay, so the truth of God's word will set you how? Free. 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 Let's keep that in our minds this week, and then we're going to go talk some more about that next week. The truth of God's word is what sets us free, and so we need to pursue that. We need to pursue biblical truth. <clears throat> so, um, Jesus actually started to take this on and, and help the disciples uh, to be able to uh, have a plan, if you will, to be able to overcome what Jesus knew that they would face in their ministry uh, after he left this earth. And so for them to be able to escape spiritual bondage, uh, it was a five-point Time to plan. Now, I'm just going to reveal this real quickly, and then we're going to dive in some more deeper next week. But those five things are not easy things. The first thing for us to escape spiritual bondage is to de deny yourself. 
All right, we got to put God first, okay? And put God's truth first in our life. Uh, we need to pick up our cross daily. Remember, take up your cross and follow who? That's right. Follow me. Jesus said those things. Uh, so the third one follows up on this is follow Christ. Not follow the lives of Satan in this world and in the presence of evil that, that so tempt us every day, sometimes every hour of our life. Follow Christ. Sacrifice that temporary, the, you know, the gain that we think that we're going to have with whatever bad choices that we're trying to make to gain the eternal. What's more important? Uh, what's more important in our lives? Is it just these things in these few brief moments as Paul describes us as a vapor? That's how long our life is? That long? Or is it in gaining the eternal, which is all eternity, to infinity and beyond, as they say in the Toy Story, right? The story of our lives needs to be more to, to infinity and beyond with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And finally, Jesus taught the sacrifice that we have to make is sometimes the pleasure of things to gain the pleasure of life. You know, we've all had these times where we've kind of been a little bit more uh, at home, more quarantined, I guess you can say, if you want the clinical word, but we've, we've spent more time uh, doing simple things. Some people have told me, man, I've read a lot of books. Or I've done a lot of sewing. Now, that's not me. That's someone else. Okay. <laughs> I'd be in the emergency room. So... Uh, the thing is, you know, we've spent time doing some simple things. The pleasure in life is not always searching after the greatest and grandest of things. It's sometimes found in the pleasure of life itself. I'm thankful for my breath. Anybody thankful for that today? That's a pretty simple thing, isn't it? But it's profound. We take it for granted. The things that sometimes we take for granted are sometimes the most impactful things in our whole life. I'm thankful for my friends. I'm thankful for all of you. I, I'm so thankful to have brothers and sisters in Christ to, to cheer with in this lifetime. I'm so thankful. I, there's so many things that you can't put a price tag on. I'm most thankful for my salvation. Anybody here thankful for your salvation? Did you ever put a price tag on that? Wow. We've got to get back. And, and I think the scripture draws us into that because in the book of Matthew, it talks about how Jesus talked to his disciples. And he said, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. These words ring so true that Jesus wanted to give his disciples some footholds. Footholds toward the cross. You know, we talked about the foothold of Satan and some of the ways that those first footholds are, that evil grips our lives, and then we start climbing up the wrong rungs of the wrong ladders. Today, Jesus says, grab hold of these footholds. And we'll never be disappointed. This is a, a very easy question, isn't it? Or is it? When you ask yourself, how's your soul today? You know, when you, when you take an inventory and say, you know, where am I in my battle against spiritual evil? Where is it? 
And, and you know, Methodist circles, this is one of our hallmark questions. How's our soul? You know, our soul is the fingerprint of God on our lives that is unique and different exactly to your specifications that your creator God made when you were put on this earth. That's our soul. It is something that is not shared by anyone. It is, it is uniquely yours. Your soul is something to guard. And I want, I want to encourage you to guard against the evil one in your life. Guard against that. Next week, I want to talk to you about how we can set that soul free if you're under bondage of any kind. We're going to work on that next week. But today, I want us to remember this. This is the most important thing you'll ever hear. If you forgot everything else I had to say, don't forget this part. Because of the death and the resurrection of Christ, we now enjoy the position and authority in him to resist Satan or evil in our lives and to walk in freedom. Let's celebrate that with a time of prayer. Thank you, God. As we have been in your word today and as we've discovered how we can somewhat uh, overcome some of the evil that we are in, just bombarded with in our life. Lord, give us a sense of your presence. Lord, make that presence so real and so much. Lord, help that time of, uh, of realization to be a, a spiritual awakening. And I thank you so much for the opportunities that we have to witness to your wonderful resurrection and, Lord, how you have blessed us beyond all blessing. And now, Father, I pray that if there's anyone within the sound of my voice that does not know you, Lord, that they would know that the first step toward getting out of spiritual bondage and the first step toward their freedom is to say yes. Yes to Jesus. Yes to Jesus being the Lord of their life. And so Lord, I praise you and thank you for your Holy Spirit as, as it prepares many hearts to say yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.